Thank you, Blair. Good morning, everybody. You guys are very chipper and energetic for 8 a.m. on the morning after the reception. So you get a gold star for that, and then you get a, a second gold star for making it all the way to the conference room on the third floor that's kind of nestled in the back of the floor that's to right. get here. Uh, so as Blair said, I'm Casey Kennedy. I'm the IT director for the Texas Office of Court Administration. Because I'm a, in a decentralized state, I always hesitate to say I'm the CIO of the Texas courts because, like I imagine in Florida, if AOC's IT director says I'm CIO for Florida courts, all the circuits would say, you want to bet? And so mine <laughs> would do the same thing. And so I'm, I, I do the statewide thing. So like electronic filing, document access, those kind of statewide projects fall under my realm. Um, I also do IT for the appellate courts, the Supreme Court, and we're one of two that have two high courts, and so we do both of those. Kevin, on the other hand. Yes. Yeah, so I'm Kevin Iverson, Chief Information Officer with the Idaho Courts. Um, we are a centralized court system, and so we provide the technology services statewide for the trial courts, appellate courts, etc. And uh, we're uh, just at the tail end of a statewide case management project that we've been, we've been working on for a few years. So in two months, I'm going on vacation. Um, uh. So we're really looking forward to it. But it's a privilege to be here to talk to you about hackathons and innovative solutions. And hopefully your users will let you go on vacation. Yes, that too. Because when do projects end on time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so this morning we're going to talk a little bit about hackathons and developing, developing some of the more innovative solutions. So real quickly, some of the things we're going to talk about. And I think this is going to be a really interesting presentation because you come, when you think of hackathons, everybody thinks of technology and computers and how we can do this. And so we'll talk a little bit very quickly what is a hackathon, um, what your court should and shouldn't expect from a hackathon event, uh, some of the things that you'd need if you decide you want to do a hackathon, and some of the lessons learned from the previous events. I've been to two. Uh, Kevin, you were at the last one, right? I was, yeah. And then you've, you've been at some other ones as well. So I'm going to go through it for more of the technology side of like if you were doing, think of a hackathon like a bunch of uh, computer nerds getting together and working on computer software kind of thing. But Kevin's going to bring a different flavor to it um, with more of the experience on the process side. So if you think of some of the things that we're doing and the concepts of, of bringing groups of people together that may not have hands in, in deep into a process, you can use these same concepts, not in technology, but more in court processes and other things to get new and innovative solutions to something that may not involve technology. Um, and so Kevin's going to bring some of that flavor to it. So what is a hackathon? I told Wes earlier I didn't have any embedded videos and I don't. I figured out how to make an animated GIF based on a video <laughs> so that, that I can just put it in and not have to worry about the AV side of things. So usually what happens in a hackathon, there's one part of experts and these are just people that know the expertise in the domain. So if uh, and we'll talk about problem sets a little on, a little later on. But if the problem is getting, uh, keeping parents of divorced kids from fighting is a real problem, and setting up visitation is a problem, or you know, you come up with a broad thing, there are experts that are in um, uh, child custody, family law type things that you can bring in so that you can make sure that the people making solutions aren't going outside of the bounds of the law. Um, because there's statute there, which is very hard to bend. There's rules, which are a little bit easier to bend. And then there's just local practices, which are very easy to bend, that there may be judges that can say, well, you know, I understand we have this local rule, but that kind of doesn't fit well with the process, so now we can get rid of it or change it. Um, then for on the tech side, I would say it's 10 part, parts computer nerds. Those are guys like me that know how to stand up servers and hook them together and have them talk to databases um, in new and innovative ways that know all these goofball third-party technologies that we don't use that can, I can bring in for free. And then sometimes it involves an all-nighter. So you come in at Friday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and you would leave Saturday at about 9 p.m. and you would be there from the entire time. And there's a whole process uh, in that. And so one of the things that 
that this does, or what the, the goal of this, is to have things to be loosely constrained. So letting everybody know that here's the statute or the rules or where you can't go, but then letting them run free after that. And um, so what that does is that fosters that, well, I didn't think about it this way, and the reason that that usually happens is, or when that comes together, is because the people that you bring in or the computer nerds that come in, they have no experience in the court space. Uh, one of the last hackathons we were in, um, it was about making the process of dealing with a traffic ticket go faster, and so this team was developing a remote app on our, their phone. Within 20 minutes, they had servers stood up in the cloud, and they were asking for a court to volunteer to get traffic data so that they could go in and play with their app, and so they got sample data and the whole impetus of it was one of the guys on the team said, I got a traffic ticket in Bakersfield, California, and it was a real pain to deal with, and I want to make it faster for others to deal with it. Uh, we had another team that had um, GIS systems uh -huh. to where they could get warrant data to where they could have a mobile app that, that law enforcement can have to say, I see you're right here. Here are three warrants that are within a five-mile radius of where you're standing right now. Can you go check on them and see if you can pick them up? And so at the end of the day, creative problem solving is the goal for all of this. Um, the way we generally work, I know I'm involved in tech day in and day out. There are some times to where I need uh, my court administrator to step in and say, hey, you're too far into the weeds looking at this. The solution is actually over here and it's very simple. So Kevin, do you wanna talk a little bit about how this would work if it was more of a, a court process based piece. Yeah, and I think that's the important part is a hackathon can be applied to a technology initiative or to court processes to really any kind of problems. And we'll talk about problem sets here in a second. But I think the key thing that I want to stress around hackathons, it's really about innovation, right? And one of the things that we struggle with as government entities and as courts sometimes, not always, is how do we create time and space for innovation? You know, hackathon, the concept has been around since the late 90s, you know, it's this whole concept of hacking code with a marathon. And so what we're going to, as, as Casey started to describe, and we'll give you some more context, we're going to talk about that classical hackathon that's usually 24, 36 hours. But the thing I want to stress is you don't have to necessarily do the whole enchilada, right? You could take concepts out of this and, and to drive innovation. You know, because one thing that I've, I've learned is that in a, the bar for innovation is really, really low, um, or, or very, very high, I mean. You know, the status quo is really low. Um, and what a hackathon does is it creates energy. It creates that energy to climb that steep hill of innovation. And that's what I really walk away from an event like a hackathon to get that innovation within my own organization. One thing I, I, I want to highlight is um, as we talk about the, the classical hackathon, I will also want to encourage you to think a little bit differently too of how could you chunk it up. You know, so one thing that we're in the process of doing right now is we're partnering with an organization called, called Code for America. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Um, Code for America, the best way for me to describe them is they're like the Peace Corps for government. They're just a bunch of volunteers who volunteer their time. Um, they have brigades which in, within, their, within uh, various regions. Um, sounds like some of you have, have heard of them or have partnered with them in the past. So, you know, we recently had a, a brigade meeting in our office on a Friday night, gathered, you know, 20 volunteers who want to come in and just do something for the courts. And they're not necessarily just t technology computer nerds. We had attorneys, we had administrative assistants who, um, you know, just, just citizens that didn't have any specific skill set. They just found it on Meetup and wanted to come in and, and, and make a difference. And then what's really encouraging is then they then identify these projects and continue to work on them over the next several weeks. And, you know, so they get together on a Wednesday night at a local pub. Hack out, hack out their code, and then like this Wednesday, you know, they're going to give us a demo of, of, what, of what they're proposing for our court application. So there's lots of different ways to be able to tackle this, whether it's through tech or whether it's through something that you want to try, just try to tackle within your own organization around a particular process or a set of processes. Right, and then one of the easiest things to foster that problem solving piece, or the, the nice thing is, is like you mentioned, there were outsiders in the room. Right. The people that were hacking those processes weren't the people that do that process, the existing process, day in and day out. It was people that were outside of the realm looking in and basically saying, now how would you do this, and letting them come up with uh, innovation on how that would work. And to your point, Casey, this whole issue around constraints and the experts, I think that's what I really find encouraging is they come in with a very, very different perspective. 
and they'll challenge your processes, they'll challenge your rules, they'll frankly challenge your statutes. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you know we as the court people can take away from them is not just the technology ideas that they're bringing, but the, the ideas that they're bringing just from their lens as, as being users of the court systems. And then on top of that, the people that are there working with the experts will challenge the experts back. Right. Because an expert will say, well, you know, in, our, in the court, it's got to go like this. And then the, the people working on it will say, well, does it really have to be that way? Yeah. Or is that just something that the judge wants to do that way? Right. And then that gets everybody thinking of, well, maybe this is a change that, that's either worthwhile to make or that we can just flip a switch and it's done. Exactly. So some of the things that as technologies that, that we see, there's a lot of over expectations with hackathons on the tech side and I would imagine on the process side it's the same thing. There's a lot of challenges around the way we've always done it. Um, many, I, it I'm the Texas courts guy. Many of you know my boss, Mr. David Slayton. He's a tech guy and he hates it if anybody shows up to a meeting and says, well that's how we've always done it. And frankly, it drives me up the wall on the tech side when my team, and I'm sure it does you, well, we've always done it that way. Well, that's great, but it's 2018 and we need to move forward on, and doing something else. So that's always a big challenge with the experts. Um, at times, if you have the right experts, they know I need to get away from the fact that this is how, he's all, how we've always done it. But there are other times where sometimes the experts just can get ingrained and so you want to be mindful of that. Um, the other thing that you should, ex I'm sorry, this is what you should expect, is um, outsider perceptions of the court. So when you bring in people from the outside, you get a really good picture of what people outside of the court realm think about courts. And some of this with the public trust and confidence, we kind of already know what people think about courts, but this gives you a very good local perspective of what, things, what people think about the courts in your area, which is always good. Um, you get process change ideas from this, obviously, and then tech change, change um, kind of ideas that we can do for this. Um, on the tech side, I can tell you that in the last couple of hackathons, there is a boatload of free tools that I was not aware of, even as the IT director, to where we had people setting up chat bots, and there's like five free tools, and all you do is program it in, and I'm sitting there going, well, this is pretty cool as the tech, one of the tech experts at two in the morning when nobody's asking me questions, I could sit there and make my own chat bot. And you know, how to text things out on notifications. And so there's a lot of good ideas. So I would encourage you too, if you have tech experts in the room to have them just be mindful of that there's a lot of technology out there that they can pick up as well. From a process side. Yeah, and to your point, what I observed at the court hack that we were at, and then recently with the work we've been doing with Code for America, is you know they bring their lens, you know, and 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 their experience with the courts, or frankly, the experience of friends that have interacted with the courts, um, and really challenge our way of thinking. So, for instance, a, a really simple example I'll give from a process um, side is around, and a lot of you are already doing this, I'm sure, is around text notifications, right? Um, we had a, one of our largest counties implement a text notification process. Um, it's a pretty, um, you know, the way they designed it is the way they think, right? You have to come in, you fill out a form, um, I give my, I, I grant permission to be able to be, to, to, to receive text. That form gets scanned in, goes into the case management system, we enter the information in manually, and then we set up the person for text notifications. Explain that to our, to our team that's working on text notifications for other counties, and they're like, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Why don't, you, why don't you just give, if I know my case number, I just text to, you know, the, whatever the number is, and I type my case number in, and I'm automatically subscribed. They're like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense, right? You know, they just bring a different lens and a different perspective that sometimes we're just so close to the problem that we think about the process and the way that we do our business day in and day out. Um, and so I really think that that's the, the refreshing part is that anybody can come in with ideas. And that's a very simplistic example. Um, but the, the encouragement that you're really trying to do is to foster a culture, a culture of, of innovation, of questioning, and of um, um, challenging the way, the way that we're doing our business. Um, and allowing these individuals from the outside, and frankly from the inside, for instance, you know, our administrative assistant is leading one of these projects now. You know, so it's an opportunity for some professional development as well within your organization to bring ideas and to build some, and to build some new skill sets within a construct of a hackathon or something that may be a little bit more elongated like Code for America. Yep, I agree. 
So here's some things that the court should not expect. Uh, at least on the tech side, I imagine on the process side, it's still there. But on the tech side, we usually see any elimination of paper. Um, and so as we move to the electronic uh, age of things, many of you have already done electronic filing. And so now we're starting to really move away from the, the paper-based things. So it doesn't surprise me that the first thing the group says is get rid of this yeah. form to scan in and key in because we can, we can take all that data in different ways. Um, the other thing that I would say on the tech side on hackathons is to never expect a production-ready product. Um, what we see a lot, and it and frustrates too strong of a word, IRC is probably better. Um, a lot of the technologists at times, when we have experts that are participating in the technology hackathons, will leave saying, hey, this guy just developed a phone app that can allow you to deal with a traffic ticket and a much easier, or a chat bot that will allow you to talk to the the prosecutor's office and cut a deal on a traffic ticket. I saw it at a hackathon. Let's implement it tomorrow. Um, and the hackathon, at, by the end, it may kind of look like this building to where you can tell it's going to be a building and it's got some glass on the bottom floors, but it's not ready to be moved into yet. And so even after the hackathons, there's a lot more work to get it scaled up or commercialized in a way to where um, even if it was given to an in-house IT team, we would have to take it and massage it a little more to get it ready for our jurisdiction so that they could use it and then it could scale to the 27 million people in our state. Um, Casey, just real quick on yeah. that point, I would also encourage that you really try to get your staff involved in the hackathon. You know, just don't let it be, you know, we're going to set it up and observe, but to be immersed in, in, in the process because then they can understand, okay, why do they use this technology stack or why do they think about building this process this direction? Because really what you're doing is it's an incubation process. It's really just trying to get a prototype stood up that you can then take in-house and be able to build upon, you know, after the, after the event. Um, and also from the process standpoint, if you have an existing process on the tech side, we've had um, people that come in and think, well, all, I've already got my process and it's perfect. I just want you to automate it. Um, and one of the things we have on the, the tech side is automation just makes things go fast. And so if you have a process that goes nowhere and you automate it, you're just going nowhere fast. And so, um, we never want the expectation of, hey, we have a problem set of doing this, pro hacking this process and making it better. Well, let's just automate that process and then it's better. Well, no, the point is to challenge the ways around, how are we doing this? Can we do this better? Is there something more efficient? Why are we doing it this way? Can we make it simpler? Um, the other things that you shouldn't expect is a cutesy website. <laughs> The last hack technology hackathon, I don't think there were any websites. Yeah. It was all phone apps or chat bots or GIS apps that mapped out things where things were and how you could do things. Um, the other thing on the tech side with um, hackathons is that you should never expect professionally dressed people. The last hackathon that we were at, it was mainly t-shirts, shorts, flip-flops and we're all sitting in this big room in New Jersey that was like the conference room of the state bar. So you could tell it's like your standard, very nice looking, dark wood, cool, like, formal. you know, <laughs> a formal courthouse with big power cords going all over the place and people that are just like off the street type of stuff. So. We have to tell our judge experts, hey, you're going to see people that are not, that are just normal people. And most of our judges are cool with that, yeah. but it's just have that expectation. And so the, the other great thing about it, and I'm sure the process side may be the same way, when you take away some of the formality of it, that'll end up fostering some of the innovation as well. Yeah, exactly. Okay, from the process side, same kind of thing. You shouldn't expect anything in yeah, a production-ready process. Yeah, with um, you know, the individuals we've been working with and some of the initiatives um, just in Idaho, you know, again, it's not just tech. It's you know, people just outside of, of the organization. Um, and they do come in with just a different lens. Um, and it takes all kinds of kinds. You know? I mean, we've got folks that, um, you know, at our last meeting, we had um, you know, a, a, a really young startup um, founder um, a guy who had sold a company and he just wants to be able to give back to the back to society. 
um, some really young college kids, you know, who are just coming up and trying to trying to get their feet wet. And um, you know, one of the things that I'm really encouraged, at least in our community, is you know we've got something that we can offer as it relates to purpose. You know, our millennial generation, as I'm sure you you understand, is they they really want to connect to something. Um, and so when they come in and you know they don't necessarily have the tech skills, but they do have you know the experience to be able to share new ideas as it relates to process. Um, you know they do tend to dress a little bit more professionally than some of the tech folks that we've seen at the hackathons. Um, you know, but again, you know it's getting that diversity of thought within the within the event um, to be able to come out with new and better ideas. Absolutely. Okay, so. Again, this is from a tech side, so don't let this scare you. Um, if you're crazy enough to do an actual tech hackathon, here's some of the things that, that need to be met. And I'll let Kevin, after this, talk to the, to the process side of it, because the process side hackathon is much simpler than, than this. So uh, this, I don't think this is an actual picture of one of our hackathons, but it looks like this. Um, one of the things that, that I, I would highly recommend is getting a hackathon logistics partner. There's several of them out there, and what they do is they do the recruiting. So if you say, I want to have a tech hackathon and I need outside partners, Kevin uses Code for America to bring other people in, and you probably have other recruitment methods you know, within your own AOC telling everybody, hey, we're doing this. If you're interested to volunteer, right. you're welcome to, to participate. And then they also do the facilitation of it. So, you know, when you, the whole process of the hackathon of bringing people in, uh, we present the problem set saying, Here's, here are the processes or, or kinds of problems that we want to solve. And um, let's split into teams and how's everybody doing. The logistics partner facilitates all that kind of stuff so that you as the host can be immersed in the, in the experience as well. From a facility standpoint, um, we need facilities that are ready for 24 by 7 use. Uh, that occurred on both hackathons that I was a participant in um, on the tech side. And so it would be like a room this size, but it has to be available 24 hours and over the weekends because the hackathons usually start on Friday and they end either very late on Saturday or very early on Sunday. And so, you know, you have to think of security and things like that and how's everybody going to feel if the court, if you're doing it at a courthouse and the courthouse usually isn't open at 2 a.m. in the morning with people running through it, how's that going to work? Um, high speed internet is a requirement for these kinds of things on the tech side. And by high speed, I mean high speed. Um, so at the last hackathon, they had four different Wi-Fi networks in the same room. And that was because each one of those, those Wi-Fi networks each had a 10 gigabyte link attached to them. And so it was like super, super high speed. You know, you click on a movie on Netflix and it immediately pops up and goes. Like no buffering whatsoever. Um, so those kinds of things are needed. Electrical power, um, strips per table. I think at, at all the ones that I've been to, it's like three or four power strips on the table, one strip per person, because everybody needs six outlets a piece to plug in their phone, their iPad, their computer, their other computer, their monitor, and their other monitor. And so they bring their own equipment. I've yeah. seen guys come <laughs> they in. They pack their own equipment. <laughs> yeah, they come in with a dolly, and there's like a gaming PC with neon and and then they're sitting there going away setting up a local server or dual a, monitors right dual monitors I've got a server up in the AWS <laughs> cloud and I just right. it's free and I okay you guys are crazy um, also spaces for sleeping meeting and judging so we had on both cases for the tech side hackathons there was the room that everybody's in and doing the work and so it would be round tables and us saying okay, we're the team and we're doing this thing. But you could say, well, you know, it's three in the morning and I need to take a two hour nap. And so we had spaces where people were bringing their sleeping bags. And so they would go to a separate room that was the quiet room and it was very dimly lit so that you could just go in and take a nap. So you don't think of things like that, but that, that was there. And then also for meeting, 
Um, that's the big room where we're all talking and working and then judging separately. So we did have judges for both of these to where the judges needed a place to go and deliberate on who was going to take things home. Obviously bathrooms are good. So if you're thinking logistics of space, you can go in this part of the courthouse except for here and there's no bathrooms in that <laughs> box, that's a real problem. Yeah, we're going to get to food We'll get to food. Second. Yeah. yeah. That's a big... Uh, but, but to Casey's yes. point, as it relates to logistics partner, one thing that if you, if you do want to do a full-on hackathon, you know, the 24, 36 hours, we'd encourage you to talk to Paul Embley, who's, who's organized a couple of the core hacks. Um, he would definitely stress that it's a much bigger initiative than you think it is. Right. Um, and, and grabbing one of these logistics partners who've done hackathons and know how to get the buzz within the local community and get the participants. Because yep. you definitely want a really good, diverse, um, diverse audience of multiple teams to kind of drive that competition and that energy. Um, and these, these organizations really know how to tap into the local college scene and the local tech community, you know, the coding camps, you know, those, those types of organizations. Right. And I know Paul's used Hacker Nest twice. Right. In Texas, we've used Tech for, tech for Justice. I know you've done Code of America. Mm -hmm. um, but even these guys, yeah, they do all the heavy lifting, so I don't have to because I'm the tech guy. I cannot, like, have Nakem and these guys organize all this space. <laughs> way over my head i don't do any of that i don't have a vowel at my disposal to go and and get all this stuff together um so food there you go <laughs> so food lots of food all of us tech people we need food um usually on day one there's lunch there's dinner there's dinner two pre-breakfast on day two breakfast then lunch on day two and so these meals, these were things like pizza, um, casseroles. There was just a, a continuous at every meal. That was what you would think a meal is. And it's like conference food where it's just tons and tons of food. Then the chips, the Red Bull, the Monster Energy drinks, the Cokes, the coffees, um, those were on the continuous snacks list. And so those were actually available 24 seven in the back of the room. And we run through, I mean, the Red Bull was constantly being replaced. The Monster Energy drinks were constantly being replaced. Um, and which is interesting because the tech guys, coffee and soda, that's too lightweight for them. They need like a real fuel. And so they were going through that. Um, we ended up after, on the first hackathon, after about the first six hours, someone came back to us on the tech table and said, hey, can someone go run out and buy mints? <laughs> because we're eating lots of food and when we're talking to each other, my teammates need mints. And so we actually went and bought a big thing of Tic Tacs and everybody came and started grabbing those too. <laughs> um, one of our tech people went out and got toothbrushes too, yeah. but they were like, I was like, nobody took those. I'm like, we're all grown adults, hopefully. Um, but anyway, so yes, food, lots and lots and lots of food. Uh, on the process side, I'm sure it's the same kind of thing. Even if you're having just little meetings, it's easy to lure people in with food. Yeah, so again, you know, taking these same concepts and principles, you could do an innovation day within your court you know, and get off site, find a facility that creates some buzz, you know, maybe, uh, you know, go to a local code camp facility, um, and, you know, where there's this kind of this incubation startup feel, you know, bring in the food, you know, have the problem sets that we'll talk about here in a second and drive that just inherent, you know, um, within your own organization, you know, you could use the same types of concepts um, to drive some, uh, some uh, review of your existing processes or using your own internal technology team uh, to be able to, to, to do some incubation of uh, some new tech ideas. And I'm always surprised at how fast the food disappears with the tech. Well, I shouldn't be. <laughs> I imagine you all experience the same thing if you have extra food from a reception or something. You just take it to the IT department and it'll be gone within 30 minutes. That, does that work yeah, that way? Yeah, yeah. We, we call it giving it to the wolves because put it in the break room, 30 minutes later you have an empty plate <laughs> and you don't see people come in and grab it, but it's just gone. So the next thing you need is good problem sets. Yeah. And Kevin, you can add to this as well. But when you do these hackathons, you want to have 
a problem set, something that you're trying to solve, and you want to be very descriptive of it, but you don't want to be prescriptive of it to tell them how to solve the problem. Um, so a bad example would be, I want to automate the process that I already have that takes this paper form and we scan it in and, and we do this and this and this, and it does case triage. I just want to automate that, that's my problem. You need your problem set to be a little bit more at a higher level to where you could say something like case flow management and then give a broad description of it and then let the teams decide in which facet of that they want to explore. Um, you want to have a problem set that's, that's helpful to the court's end users. Um, generally on the tech side we want something that helps people that are coming into the court and so we shy away from problem sets that are like I've got all these deputy clerks or I've got all these court admin people that are doing this and this and this and it's taking them a long time and I want them to work faster but the people outside of the court are never going to see that. That's kind of like yeah that's great but you should just go do that rather than something that we can help everybody that's, that's working with the court. Another good problem set is human factors. If it's something that um, will help enrich and better the lives of, of a human outside of the court those are the best kinds of problem sets because then when you bring people in from the outside, they get a really good feeling that, hey, we're actually making a difference for society rather than just, you know, being used as free labor to, to, to run a process. So you want to talk a little yeah, bit from the process sets, side? The, the one thing I would say is, um, you know, work with your staff, but also with your constituents, the people that interact with the courts to help define the problem sets. You know, a simple question of what are the top five challenges within our sector? What are the top five challenges or top three challenges that you have in interacting with the courts? And help them, you know, or allow them to be able to kind of define those categories of the problem sets um, that you're going to propose to the individuals that are going to come and be, you know, participate as part of your hackathon or your innovation day. The other thing that I saw that was really exciting is to allow what we call a wild card. So, mm -hmm. you know, giving them the permission to think of a problem, you know, that they want to solve. Um, but that's also why it's really important to have the experts because the experts can then put, provide some context around, yeah, that's actually a problem that we do need to think about or, you know, we, we've addressed that in this way, but perhaps we could, we could you know, come at it from a, di a different angle. Um, so giving that permission to go outside of that problem set is also really important as part of the hackathon. And so as part of the process of it, when you can imagine a room full of people and not everybody's working on individual pro or project individually, so what will happen is, is perhaps Kevin will say, you know, I'm really interested in problem set number one, which deals with this problem. Well then, there are going to be five other people in the room saying, well tell me about what your idea is. And Kevin may say, well you know, with this facet of case flow management, I think we need to do a phone app that will do some of the assessments so that we can tell where it needs to go. And they may be interested in that, say, you know, I want to help you with that. And then so now Kevin can form a team. There are people that come in in groups of yeah. five or six that they already know, yeah, I want like, to do number two and we don't need anybody else right. for a team. Again, the logistics partners are really good at going through and facilitating that because they'll say, okay, let's go through the problem sets and we'll tell you about what they are and introduce the experts that we have for these problem sets. Now let's identify the teams and if you've got six teams and two teams that are actually half a team and then a bunch of people standing around that don't have a team then they'll actually bring everybody together and say okay let me let's let you tell us what your skill set is and then you may have that half of that team say hey maybe you should be on our team right. and so they facilitate that process as well yeah they actually pitch their ideas to each other explain their skill sets and then kind of start to self select who's going to be part of their team. Because at the end of the day, this is also a competition. You know, there's prizes at the end. And so they, they really want to try to stack their team, um, you know, beyond the professional hack hackathon guys, you know, that bring their full team in. Um, you know, they really do try to balance their team out um, as it relates to um, their skill sets as well as the ideas that, that, that they're pitching right. to each other. And so, again, on the process side, I imagine that's where it, it gets good because you may have AOC staff to right. where, you know, You'll have, well, I'm the administrative assistant in IT, and so I kind of know how the computers work and how right. their processes sure. work. And, well, I want you on my team so I know how to get things through or, or what, what uh, is being thought in those kinds of things. Um, the other thing that is very good to have are good experts and good judges. Um, and so 
with your experts and judges, we typically see three flavors. And even on the process side, it's probably the same three flavors. Um, court staff that know the business side of your problem sets. So if you're doing, um, say, hackathon and one of your problem sets is relating to case flow management, you want experts that know things about case flow management, um, that know the overall concepts of it at the high level and can kind of guide the teams on what's trying to be done with that. You also want actual end users as some experts. Um, this was very helpful in, in several previous hackathons to where uh, one, of the problem ship, uh, one of the problem sets was around guardianship and how to, how to manage guardianships in the court. Well, it was great to have an actual end user as one of the experts as someone who is a guardian over somebody and can talk about their experience as being a guardian so that the teams can say, well, would this work for you or is this something that would be easier for you to deal with rather than just kind of, well, if I were doing it, this is what I would think. So it's good to have that expert view. And then also on the IT side, having some technology staff in the room is also helpful because generally speaking, we all know what the court's tolerance to pushing IT into the current century is. And so like, for example, in Texas, our courts are very tolerant of it. So if I go to, if I were to go to David and say, hey, this group has a, a nice free chat bot. It only needs about two more weeks of work from our team and then we can have it up and running. I know David's gonna say, that's great. You got a week, get it up. Let's go and make it go fast. Um, but there are other courts that if, if I come, if I were as an IT guy came to, your, to a court and said, hey, I want a chat bot the judges would say, well, wait a minute. This is, is it here on site? Well, no, it's out in the cloud. Well, we don't want that and we can't do this. And so those IT experts are there to make sure that, that the technology that's not being used isn't, is something that we can then commercialize and scale up because if you have this prototype and there's no way to scale it up and use it in anything other than just the idea, then we, we kind of need to railroad people into stuff that we can actually use. The, the other big thing on experts is you want people that don't, aren't just experts in their area, but are also um, willing to engage actively, proactively with these groups. You know, so a couple of um, lessons learned that we've, you know, we may cover in our lessons learned slide, but with hackathons is um, these individuals really want to connect and get feedback you know, real time within the, within the process. And so it requires the experts to be available sitting on the side of the room, but to also be intermingling on an active basis um, with these individuals, just asking questions, um, inquiring, and offering some feedback so you can kind of keep them into a path where you end up with a product that actually, you know, truly does solve a problem right. for you. And then what it usually, or, and I've seen this happen several times, is that if uh, your experts, at least on the, the business side, on the court side, if they're more of your process evangelicals to say, hey, we should really try this process. Uh, we've had instances, and I'll, I'll pick on Kevin Bowling. Kevin was one of our experts, and he was very interested in what this one team was doing. And so he had proposed to them by the end of the hackathon, hey, I think you've got something good going on. If you want to, we can work with you, and you can try and put this in in my county. Or I've got a pilot test court for you to play with to see this may be something that we actually use. So if you have those experts that may be a judge that really likes to try this process, it may be that those become a pilot to try out something new and to help mature that to a point to where that it becomes production ready. Right. Exactly. So now the fun part, which is always difficult to do when you're in government, is prizes. Um, so I know when you do the logistics partners, there's ways to just say, how much is it gonna cost to do this? And then you just pay the bill and you're done. And then they can do things like make sure the food's there and make sure the prizes are done. Um, but generally you want prizes for the top three. On the tech side, when it's technology, it's very easy. They want money. I believe, uh, the prizes at the last one were in the, the first prize was like either 500 or 1,000, and then it was like 500 and then 250 down from there. Um, at most of the court ones, there's, um, we had vendor support in one of them that the vendor said, hey, we've got an incubation tank in California. We'll sponsor 
a week paid trip to San Francisco to come work in our incubator for a week and, and further flesh out your product. Um, in uh, Utah, when we did it in Utah a while ago, or a few years ago, it was, the prize was, in addition to a little bit of money for first prize, each of the top three got to have lunch with the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court just to talk about courts. And again, it goes back to the being connected that to us, having lunch with the Chief, I've done that before and it's nice and it's fun, but he's a regular guy. But to people that aren't involved with the courts all the time, you know, there's a lot of gravitas to that of like, hey, this is really cool. I'm talking with the, the head judge of our state on different things that I'm passionate about. Um, more prizes are better, but the thing, at least on the tech side, is most of the tech people don't appreciate the everybody's a winner <laughs> mentality. And so there has to be losers in the lot as well. And so they like, they don't want, here's your participation ribbon in the hackathon. They want to compete and, and go for it. So what ends up happening is at the end of the hackathon, there's a slot of about an hour and a half to where each team gets up and does a presentation on the product that they have. And so usually the morning of that, they've wrapped up coding on whatever it is they're doing. And they're working on PowerPoints or movies or something to present to the group. And we have people that hook up their phones and see I've got it on my phone here and I'm clicking here and doing that and that's after you know a day, day and a half of work. And it's usually a prototype, but it's stuff that's actually working. Yeah, on so, that point, oh, go ahead. How many teams do you typically have in the hackathon? I've oh. seen as little as seven and as many as about 15. Yeah. And it, so it takes a little while to get through. You want to leave about 10 minutes for each demo because it's about two minutes to, to stand up, three minutes for a demo, four to five for Q&A. Right. Um, the one thing I would say, a lot of these people, you know, they, they haven't gotten up and presented before. Um, and so you really need to be clear about, okay, what, what's the expectation for the demo? Um, give them time to prep for it. Uh, maybe even maybe even rehearse. Right. Um, it's a great opportunity for them, you know, not just to come and ha hammer out some code, but just to learn some skills in regards to right. interacting with with the other. And I know that on both of them, we did have uh, time set aside to where if you were a tech team and you were uncomfortable presenting, we would have a room set aside with a couple of people that were there to kind of walk through your presentation and coach you to say, well, you know, the judges here at the front are all court experts and. You can't go into the, the detail of what server you hook to what and where it is and the technology you're using. They really don't care about that. Yeah. They want to know about the process that you've changed and what you're doing, the functionality right. is. Yeah, and I think to your question around number of um, attendees and teams also goes to how well you market and what your prizes are. In fact, I was just looking at the core hack in Utah. The top prize was $5,000. Know, oh, so nice. for, for a team, you know, so you have to make that decision early. Are you going to partner with vendors because you know that's pretty much vendor vendor sponsored then um, and if you are partnering with vendors then you can offer better prizes but then that drives you know typically better participation and better competition right. and that type of thing um, and I'll tell you even when you work with a logistics partner it's always scary the day of the hackathon because you know that all these people have registered for it because you put out yeah. a carrot of five thousand right. dollars but you don't know who's going to show up until they actually show up. And IT people, as you may know, are not necessarily the promptest group in the bunch. <laughs> and so we, you know, I know in Texas when we were using Tech for Justice, the day before I remember walking through with our logistics partner and we were in the Capitol Foundry in Austin. So that's a big startup incubation place that's on the top floor of the Omni Hotel and they, they were working the logistics. And so you walk in the room and it's empty and there's all these tables with power and internet and it's ready to go. And I remember walking out and calling David and saying, well, this is either going to be a great success or a horrible, horrible failure. And there's not going to be any in between. And so, you know, I didn't really get to sleep that much that night. But then the next day when we started the hackathon, all the tables were filled. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> this is going to be a success. The chief's coming in to give the introductory speech in about an hour and a half, and he'll be happy that all these people are, are interested in helping Texas courts. And so it's, it's a little nerve-wracking, yeah, yeah, but sure. it's there. So tell us a little bit on if you do a process kind of hack, what kind of prizes do you, well, do like you on, generally if see? If you do something internally, um, you know, because really the hackathons we talk about with the big prizes are typically more technology 
um, you know, oriented. But if you do something that's more process oriented, again, like an innovation day, or I'll talk about another, another approach here in a second, which is a little bit of a reverse on the prize, is you know, just time off or a bonus, you know, a $1,000 bonus if you know, we implement your, your, your concept, your idea. You know, just again, trying to drive that innovation and that culture and that competition within your organization. Another approach is I'm sure you've all seen Shark Tank, yeah? Um, you know, of doing that within your organization. Have people come and pitch ideas to a panel within your organization and offer up a certain amount of budget to them, say it's $10,000, $20,000, to go then implement that project and let them own it and then come back and demonstrate it you know, to, to that panel in three, four months or whatever that time period is. So there's different ways to incentivize people um, you know, to be able to uh, you know, participate in these events. To add to the Shark Tank though, Going back to the the need for courts to be amenable to failure, mm -hmm. right? Don't fire the people if you do Shark Tank. Yeah, if right. I if if I <laughs> pitch an idea and say right. I've got this great idea for a process enhancement, it's going to cost about five thousand dollars, but I think we can have it implemented in a month. Right. If it fails, no harm, no foul. That's part of our innovation budget. We failed and we failed fast, and we're on to the next idea. Um, but, but you may have failed in the idea, but you haven't failed in what you're really trying to accomplish, which is your culture, right? Right. Is to change that mindset that they can bring ideas and stretch and stretch the organization. Yep, I agree. So in the, on the tech side, we do have ground rules that our, our logistics vendor goes off at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. And that is the, the fact that if you're having outsiders in the courtroom, if it's internal, you know most of the people. And so you know personality traits and quirks, and it may be that, Casey and Kevin work really well together as long as they're 15 feet apart and we know that that can get loud at times, but that's just how they are and it'll be okay. Um, but we do have general rules about kindness, respect, uh, the right to be heard, also the right to pass. We, you know, people have different learning styles. Some people like to get whatever's on their mind out on the table. Others like to absorb it and think about it for a while before they express their ideas. So just letting everybody understand that there are all these personality traits and then to be kind, be respectful of everybody, that that usually helps. Um, and then the other thing that needs to be said, or at least on the tech side, it's more of an issue. And I think on the process side, it's not as much of an issue, but clarity around who owns what gets produced. So on the technology side, if I'm on a team of six people and we make a phone app that is a very good prototype and it wins first prize, who owns that phone app? Is that the court? Is that the team of six? Is it the vendor that sponsored it so that you could get a $5,000 prize? Who owns that intellectual property? And so usually what happens is with the ground rules, it's the team that owns the intellectual property. And so we kind of go over that at the, at the or the logistics partner goes over that at the beginning right after the ground rules of being nice to each other to say, now you understand that your team owns that intellectual property. Um, the other thing that we've seen in the past on the tech side is then that allows um, vendors to also have their own teams. And so it could be that you have a problem set around case flow management and one of the CMS vendors decides to send their team to come in and compete in a hackathon because they may use that as part of their R&D and the innovation around how to put things together. And so if they do that then that vendor owns that IP that they generate for that hackathon. Um, I know that uh, the one in Jersey had vendors in it competing, like writing code and doing things. Um, but the ground, the rule was is that if you were a vendor and you won, you don't get the money because you're going to commercialize it and you will get your money. And it'll more than likely be a lot more than $5,000 because I haven't seen a vendor sell a software that's less than $5,000. No, with our experience, like with Code for America, if we develop something, it's now made available just as open source, you know, so that that team doesn't own it. You know, the, the ground rules are, you know, it goes into a repository that's right. made available across the country that anybody can be able to pull from to either reuse that code or reuse the logic of, of the process um, or, or of the application. So again, it's really about just having real clear guidelines in regards to that ownership question right. up front before you get started with the initiative. And Saves there's a lot of, lot of headache. And uh, there's just a ton of options that you can go yeah, that route. Sure. And so from the process side, I imagine if it's a court process that we're hacking through to, to, on a hackathon. Yeah, you really don't have the same you issue. You don't have that same yeah. issue. Yeah. Although it'd be kind of, you know, 
Casey presents case flow <laughs> management, and then like I have to license it to every. That'd be that'd be a good retirement package. Okay, uh, very quickly, some of our lessons learned. Um, the first thing that we learn is make sure whatever food will satisfy other dietary concerns. We do that at conferences. You have to do that here too. Um, the tech people are very picky eaters at times, and so I know that there are other people that are like, I can't have any, any tree nuts, I can't have meat, I can't have this kind of thing. So just make sure that whatever food you have will um, satisfy the entire breadth of, of people that come in. Um, like we said, some of the decisions that you have to make ahead of time on the tech side, who owns the code, the, the product, the process, um, and then can vendors participate? Uh, when we did the one in New Jersey, that was the first time we allowed vendors to come in and participate as teams. Uh, the one in Utah, they weren't allowed to come in, and it was just regular people. Um, the location, you generally want to pick a place that people are passionate about serving other people. Um, New Jersey was fine, um, Salt Lake City was fine, Austin is fine, so we usually go through big metropolitan areas and it's usually where you find colleges. So if your court is in the middle of a rural county and there's no source of young people that want to code, then that's very difficult to have a, a hackathon versus like Austin, Texas, where there's four colleges within walking distance of the capital that has, all, they all have computer science programs with people that like free food and money that we can come in. Uh, and then also with the timing of it, uh, there was an issue with the New Jersey Hackathon that was a timing issue is that it was done in the very middle of May, which happens to be the same week that final exams were going on. And so the attendance was a little bit more depressed than what we were expecting, but it was because people had signed up back in March, not realizing that week was finals week. And then when finals week came, they're working on finals instead of doing uh, hackathons. Um, and so just keep in mind of that. And then also, generally, we have these on the weekend. So Kevin, you want to go over yeah, some so of the stuff that we do? Like the Code for America, one thing that we've had to learn and kind of adjust our schedules to is, you know, these are people who have day jobs, right? You know, and so the, the classical hackathons are going to be a lot of the college students, you know, techies, you know, who have weekends off, that type of thing. Um, you know, like with Code for America, you know, they've got, they've got day jobs. So we do a lot of evening, um, you know, type events in order to, fr to, to free up their, their time. Um, and so one of the things that we really try to stress is our involvement with them. Um, so we may stagger shifts, you know, or schedules within our organization so that people can stay till, you know, seven, eight, nine at nine at night on a Friday night um, and try to, and, you know, try to be active participants of that. Um, you know, I think the, the big lesson learned I would, I would share with you, and it's a quote that came from um, uh, a lady named Cecilia Nunes. She was a domestic policy advisor in the Obama administration. And, and one of the things that she really stressed was, um, you know, engaging users is not about the is is not the way that we should just make tech. It's the way that we should make government, right? And I think that's what's exciting about using things like hackathons or Code for America or Innovation Days or what, or what have you. It's not just about the tech side of it. It's about how do we look at the way that we operate ourselves um, and and how do we engage them and get their input. Um, and so that the whole timing, location, you know, participation, ownership, you know, really anything you can do to lower the barriers. Um, to be able to get them to come in and be active participants is really what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, just because we're awesome IT folks, we've got five minutes left for questions. So what kind of questions do you guys have about hackathons? Yes. So this isn't really a question, but it's um, hopefully I can share some ideas with you all. Yeah. Um, I need to wait for a mic. Yes, please. Oh. So I'm from the National Center for State Courts, and we are um, embarking upon some new idea to try to get innovative solutions. It's called a, we're calling it a visathon. We're looking at our court structure charts and trying to figure out a better way to display them and make them interactive and make them very flexible. Oh, cool. And then we're going to try to pair up a database underneath it so that people can kind of drill through and be able to get some of the real key information um, that users are really wanting. Um, so we're trying to just think about how to redo this completely, but we're doing it in a, a virtual setting instead nice. of 
on site. So that right. might be something you all might want to think about. Um, but we're trying to do it virtually, and we'll have live streaming with the judging and so on. Um, cool. We're launching it this week, so it's really exciting. It's at ncsc.org slash visithon. So, <laughs> awesome. Nice. Anyway, just a different way to think about um, how to host it, too. Right. Right. Virtually. Yeah. And, and you bring up a great point. One of the things that you can do, and I haven't seen this done in a court setting, but I've seen it done in other hackathons, to where you can jointly do things. One of the things that happened on the executive branch side, there was a hackathon on uh, with the executive branch departments or agencies, and there was one in Texas, and there was one in Indiana at the same time, and they were live streaming back and forth, and it turned into a nice little competition the IT, the head of the IT department in the executive branch of both states made bets with each other, much like the governors do when the football teams play. But then that kind of brought an extra level of competition so that even though there were teams that were working together in Texas virtually for a period of time, they knew, yeah, I'm competing against Kevin who's sitting up a few tables away from me, but I'm also really competing. I want him to succeed. Yeah because I can't have those people in Indiana beat us here in Texas. And so that's another way that where you can link things to where if, because you're all here at NACOM, one of the values of this is networking. And so you know people in other courts and other states and other jurisdictions. And so it may be that, hey, we're gonna do a group virtual hackathon type thing to where we're gonna, here's the problem sets and now we're gonna compete with each right. other internally, but also at more of a national level as well. And then that gets into the sharing of, yep. Because you may get a, a good process from Idaho that I can just tweak a little yeah. bit and then it fits right into Texas to what we're trying to do. That's exciting. Well, um, I have a question. What about, so when you hire this outside contractor, I guess is what it is basically, mm -hmm. uh, what type of, I'm thinking of contracts and city attorney's approval and all uh, those lovely, lovely things <laughs> that we're going to have to deal with in Fort Worth. So what would you recommend about that? Can, what can you tell us? I, I have not seen the contracts that, uh, that Paul used for Hacker Nest, but I'm sure he's, he would be happy to share, or I'm not going to put words in the mouth that he'd be happy to share, but I'm sure he can provide good guidance on how that all works. I'm imagining it's set up like any other kind of contract to where you go back and forth on terms and conditions and cost. Um, the way I would do it in Texas is more of just like a, a deliverable-based fixed kind of contract of like, I'm, I'm charging you with delivering a hackathon, and let's talk about what the cost is and the terms and conditions around that, and it's just one number. The hackathon's gonna cost how many ever thousands of dollars, and then you take care of it. And I don't wanna know the details of how, what's profit and what goes to who, that's none of my business. It's just a very quick hackathon, X number of dollars, and it's done. I don't know, honestly. I don't We'd know. have to follow up with Paul. We'd have to know, follow up with to Paul. Engaging with Hacker Nest I'm willing to bet it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, if you're going to do the full thing with a logistics partner, you're more than likely going to need some vendor based sponsorships right. in order to cover some of that cost for sure. But I would imagine if you're doing a, when you guys do it in, in Idaho, at the process based one, the cost is. is uh, it's all incubation. It's, I mean, it's, it's all, all the in kind time yeah. that you're spending of your staff time to get stuff rolling on that. Oh, but we're, we're webcasting to people on, on the, in the tubes. In the tubes. Just another thought. I mean, we, this kind of pairs with another recruitment session that we have. But, I mean, hackathons could also be used in, in oh, ways yeah. to, right, to oh, engage absolutely. the public. Yeah. But also recruitment, right? For I mean, sure. that, all these young college students. And, right? So that, that's a great point. And I, yeah. the story that I have from, uh, from both hackathons is that the, the teams that won either one of them uh, or that were in the top of those, these were kids that were in their 20s, and so you'll remember the ones that uh, won in Utah that we brought them to e-courts in Las Vegas later on that year, and these are, these are kids that are much closer to my son's age than they are my age, and they were just really ecstatic about it, and I can tell you the IT experts that were in the room, we were all walking around fighting with each other because Kevin's like, I'm going to do them as, I want them as an intern. No, 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 they're my intern. No, 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 I'm going to have five intern spots. And so that's the other thing that we do is that if I know in my IT budget I have room for interns 
and I know that my management style is I really don't care where you are, it's just here's what you're doing and is it getting done, that I can have remote interns and so if they're living in Utah, it doesn't really matter, I can still pay them and they can be my interns remotely. And so yeah, we use that as a great recruitment of, hey, these people really know what they're doing and they seem to work well on a team. Let's grab them. Yeah, it's you'll, great you'll recruitment just to identify it. talent, but also just to get awareness in the community about who you are and that you're engaged with technology. I mean, that in of itself is is well worth it. So absolutely. All right. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for having us. We really appreciate it. We hope that uh, y'all take this information and can put together at least a mini process hackathon in your office. Because I think you know, at the end of the day. It's really rewarding when you can change things, and then all of a sudden things start running yep. much faster. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.